The year 1816 was the first since the onset of the French Revolutionary Wars in which the Western world was at peace. In Europe, the nightmare of the Napoleonic Wars began to fade. In North America, Washington, D.C. began the process of rebuilding after being burned by the British Army during the War of 1812. Global commerce was expected to thrive, unimpeded by the raiding ships of nations locked in a death grip with each other. Farmers expected strong markets for their crops. Shippers looked forward to record profits. Manufacturers Manufacturers hoped the return of peace would create demand for their products. But then a rather funny thing happened. There was no summer. As late as August of that year, hard freezes in the farmlands of Upper New York and New England destroyed what little crops had been planted during a spring of continuous snow and freezing weather. 1816 was the year of no summer, not just in North America, but across the Northern Hemisphere. Record cold, freezing rains, floods and frosts occurred throughout the months in which warmer weather could be reasonably expected, given centuries of its showing up more or less on schedule. It did not, and without a global communication system to understand why, the underpinnings of civilization, farming and trade suffered across the globe. The year with no summer is now understood to have been the result of a series of geological events which masked the sun with volcanoes dust, but to those who endured it, it was simply an inexplicable disaster. The commercial effects continued to be felt for years, as financial markets roiled from the unexpected disruption of trade and investments. For those unconcerned with climate change, it remains a stark, though wholly ignored, warning of the power of nature. And here are just a few of its impacts. Number 10. Thomas Jefferson found his indebtedness increased by drastic crop failures. In 1815, former President Thomas Jefferson, living in retirement at his Monticello estate, offered his personal library as replacement for the losses suffered by the Library of Congress when the British burned the American capital. The sale was a gesture which gained Jefferson some temporary praise, but more importantly to him, it provided an infusion of badly needed capital. The former president was broke, and the $23,950, almost $400,000 today he received alleviated some, but by no means all, of his indebtedness. Jefferson was relying on a strong crop from his Virginia farms in 1816 to reduce his debts further. In his farm book for 1816, Jefferson noted the unusual cold as early as May. Repeated frosts have killed the early fruits and the crops of tobacco, and wheat will be poor. Jefferson struggled with the bizarre weather throughout the summer months, recording temperature and rainfall data that's still used by scientists studying the phenomenon today. Jefferson was unaware of the cause, but he did lament its effect. Jefferson's corn and wheat crops were reduced by two-thirds, his tobacco even more so, and the former president slipped yet more deeply into debt. This was not a unique thing. Many of the farmers in the American states of Virginia, Maryland, Kentucky, Tennessee, and all of New York and New England suffered the same fate. The failure of tobacco crops was particularly devastating. Ships which normally would have carried the cured leaves to Europe lay idle, and British tobacconists shifted to plantations in Africa as the source of the plant. During the summer, Jefferson reported frosts in every month of the year in the higher elevations of Virginia and in every state north of his farms. Number 9. Prices of grains spiked as the summer went on and remained high for nearly three years. In Virginia, oats were a crop which was considered essential to the survival of the economy. Oats were consumed by humans in the form of porridge and in oat breads and cakes, but the grain was also an essential part of the diet of horses. Horses were, of course, critical in the early 19th century as motive power for plows and transportation. The shortage of oats caused the farmers who produced it to respond to the insatiable demand for the grain by raising their prices on the little they were able to harvest. According to Jefferson and other Virginia farmers, oats cost roughly 12 cents per bushel in 1815, a price already inflated by the demand placed on the crops by the recently ended War of 1812. By midsummer 1816, oats had increased to nearly $1 per bushel, an increase which meant that most were unable to pay. The shortage of grain, as well as other fodder, meant that horses were often undernourished. European markets were unable to make up the shortage, as Europe too was locked in the grip of low temperatures and excessive rains. In Europe, the cost of maintaining horses increased dramatically, and the use of horseback for individual travel became a privilege for a wealthy few. A German tinkerer and inventor by the name of Karl Dreis began experimenting with a device consisting of a piece of wood equipped with a seat upon which a person would perch while moving the legs in a manner similar to walking. 
called variously the Velocipede, the Laus machine, and the Dracine, it was the precursor of what is today known as the bicycle. Number 8. Temperatures throughout the Northern Hemisphere were abnormally cold, especially in New England. The New England states were particularly hit during the summer of 1816 by abnormally low temperatures. In the New England states, which were at the time still mostly agricultural, every month of the year suffered at least one hard frost, devastating crops in the fields and the fruit trees, which had managed to blossom during the long and wet spring. On June the 6th, a Plymouth, Connecticut clockmaker noted in his diary that six inches of snow had fallen overnight, and he was forced to wear heavy mittens and his great coat during his customary walk to his shop. Sheep were a product of many New England farms, well adapted to grazing on the hillsides in pastures too small to accommodate cattle herds. Shorn in late winter, as was customary, many died in the unexpected colds, and the price of lamb and mutton reached record highs. By the end of June, temperatures in New England had begun a roller coaster ride which they would retain for the rest of the summer, further damaging crops and livestock. Late June in western Massachusetts saw temperatures reach 101 degrees only to plummet to the 30s over the 4th of July. Men went about in their hayfields, harvesting their sparse yields dressed in overcoats. Beans, a long staple crop of New England, froze in the fields. From Puritan pulpits across the region, the weather was attributed to a righteous judgment of God. In August, there was measurable snowfall in Vermont, and though winter wheat crops yielded some harvests, the cost of moving the grain to market was often prohibitive. New Englanders, especially in the rural areas, began to forage off the land in a manner of their ancestors, surviving on what game and wild plants they could find in the woods. Number 7. The Lack of Summer Provided One of Literature's Most Infamous Characters Most people had no idea what the scientific reasons were behind the bizarre weather in the summer months of 1816. Many of the wealthy, better able to weather the storm, so to speak, went about out their business despite the adverse weather conditions. In Europe, a group of young English writers and their guests summered at Lake Geneva in Switzerland. The group included Lord Byron and an English poet by the name of Percy Shelley, who brought with him his wife, the former Mary Wollstonecraft. Housebound by the continuing inclement weather, the group was forced to find ways to entertain themselves. Bored of playing parlor games, one of the members, probably Lord Byron, suggested that each member of the group write a story along the lines of a ghost story for the entertainment of the rest. Mrs. Shelley at first balked at the idea, unable to come up with a plot until mid-July when she confided to her diary that at the group's nightly discussions she arrived at the idea of perhaps a corpse could be reanimated. She began writing a short story which grew into a full-length gothic novel which she entitled Frankenstein or The Modern Prometheus. Her husband was later credited with assisting Mary with the work, though the extent of his contributions to the classic tale of horror remains disputed by scholars. Mary Shelley later credited her inspiration to a waking dream which came upon her during one of her long walks in the woods around Geneva. Shelley wrote that while her husband Percy, who committed suicide in 1822, helped her with technical aspects of the writing, the tale was wholly her own. Number 6. The Year With No Summer Coincided With The End Of The Little Ice Age The year without summer is commonly ascribed to the summer months of 1816, though its effects were felt for three years, part of the final stage of what is known as the Little Ice Age. Crop failures were acute in the first harvest season of the period, and such continued for at least another two years. Wet and cold weather impeded planting in the spring as well as harvests in the fall, and the size of the harvests from North America to China were insufficient to support the populations. Hunger became famine in many areas, including Europe and China. Residents of rural communities migrated to urban areas in search of food through begging, and population density grew these diseases, which strengthened among hungry populations, including cholera and typhus. Medicine of the time it was inadequate to treat either. The result was globally felt, at least in the Northern Hemisphere. Calamity, which encompassed starvation, diseases, and popular unrest for a period of three years. Hundreds of thousands of former soldiers, veterans of the Napoleonic Wars, roamed Europe seeking the means to feed themselves and their families. In England, sailors who had manned the ships of His Majesty's Navy found themselves unemployed as warships were decommissioned and the absence of crops reduced the amount of goods available for international trade. Ships rotted at their moorings. By the summer of 1817, organized groups of former soldiers across Europe were rioting in the belief that government warehouses held grain being kept from the starving people. In the United States, especially in the still largely agricultural New England, failed crops caused farmers to pull up stakes and head for the promised lands west of the Ohio River. Number 5. The Swiss disaster of 1816 to 1817 was among the worst of the global catastrophe. Over a period of 153 days between April and September of 1816, Geneva, Switzerland, 
Switzerland recorded 130 days of rain. The temperature remained too cold for snow in the Alps to melt, which prevented the disaster from being far worse. The streets, and more importantly the sewers and drains of Geneva, were flooded, and Lake Geneva was too swollen with rain to absorb the runoff. Meanwhile, local crops were drowned by the incessant chill rains, and the harvest of 1816 was a complete failure, leading to the last recorded famine on the European continent. The lack of fodder led to the demise of hundreds of thousands of draft animals, and cattle and oxen died in the waters in the fields. Hundreds of thousands of Swiss were rendered homeless, living in the streets and fields, unable to feed themselves as the brutal cold of an alpine winter settled upon them. Beginning in early 1817, the death rate in Switzerland, already well above normal due to starvation and disease, increased by more than 50%. Oxen, horses, and cattle dead from starvation and rotting in the fields became sources of food for the desperate populace. Aid from European neighbors was non-existent as the harvests on the continent and in England were similarly sparse. France had but recently survived its revolution and the ravages of the Napoleonic era. It was short of manpower, and its newly restored monarchy was inadequate to the challenges of the disaster which they had befallen. As the seemingly unending winter lengthened, it soon became obvious to the people of Europe that those of wealth and privilege were better able to cope, and that the burden of suffering was being borne by the urban and rural poor. Number four, the year with no summer was well documented by the educated and wealthy, including Thomas Jefferson. In the United States, former President Thomas Jefferson left behind a record of meteorological events which was so detailed it remains in use by scholars and scientists studying the global disaster two centuries later. In modern times, it is compared to scientific data acquired through means not understood in Jefferson's day. For example, the studies of tree rings cut from trees which were alive during the catastrophe in Vermont indicates that for the period, including 1816, there was little or no growth which corresponds to notes left by Jefferson in his farm book and other diaries. These recorded observations that he made hundreds of miles to the south. Among the observations left by Jefferson are records of rainfalls which, while devastatingly heavy in some areas, were scant in others, including Jefferson's Virginia. Jefferson wrote to Albert Gallatin during the end of the summer of 1816, describing the shortage of rainfall which had been prevalent during the ending of the growing season, as well as the unseasonably cold temperatures. Jefferson, who used the records he had prepared every year since occupying his little mountain as a basis, informed Gallatin that an average normal rainfall for the month of August was nine and one-sixth of an inch. Rainfall for August 1816 had been less than one inch. We only had an eighth of an inch, and still it continues. He also noted the continuing cold weather conditions, including the frost swell to the north of Virginia, of which he had learned about through correspondence. Yet not Jefferson, nor any other student of science or the weather of the time, was able to postulate the global disaster had been due to a natural event occurring many thousands of miles away. Number three, in England, the army was called out to crush urban uprisings of the starving. England's, which had been instrumental in the formation of the coalition which crushed Napoleon, was particularly hard hit by the lack of growing season. Unable to feed itself with the best of harvests, England found its own crops devastated by the adverse weather, and its trading partners were unable to provide food in sufficient quantities to make them affordable for most of its population. England had already endured years of shortages as the nation threw its might behind the wars with Napoleon, and the people, by 1816, that simply had enough. As early as in the spring of 1816, food and grain riots were experienced in the West Counties. Mobs locked up local magistrates and fought the militia, which mustered to rescue them. By the following spring, mobs in the urban centers of the Midlands were common. 10,000 armed and angry people rioted in Manchester that March. The summer of 1817 saw the British Army called to quell riots and other uprisings in England, Scotland, and Wales, while the transports to the newly established penal colonies were increased. Local landlords and magistrates often ignored the pleas of the authorities in London, establishing their own mini fiefdoms through the promises of bread and grain. In England, as well as on the European continent, demands from the wealthier classes led to an increase in more more authoritarian governments and the subsequent loss of civil liberties. On the other side, the suspicion that governments were hoarding food and grain at the expense of the poor led to a rise in radical thought, especially in France and Germany. Number two, the Great Migration from New England to the West began in 1816. Most history books attribute the movement of the American agricultural population to the West following the War of 1812 to the ends of the threats from the Indian tribes that were formerly supported by their British allies. The end of British influence was no doubt part of the mass migration, but it takes more than just the potential of new 
lands to uproot families from farms that were held by their ancestors for generations. The catastrophic crop failures, which began in 1816, were a large part of the motivation for the movement to the West, as indicated by the massive depopulation of New England states, which began during the year with no summer. Particularly hard hit was Vermont and New Hampshire, as residents packed up and left for the West. For many of them, it was a journey away from divine punishment, a new exodus to a promised land, a view encouraged from pulpits. The move coincided with a religious revival across America, which became known as the Second Great Awakening, a return to the fundamentalism which had protected Americans from the ravages of an angry god, in the view of many. Number 1. During the global cooling, the Arctic experienced warming and ice melt. As nearly all of the Northern Hemisphere saw decreased temperatures and abnormal rain patterns, the Arctic, including the ice cap, experienced a sharp increase in temperature, which led to a melting of the ice at the top of the world. The receding ice cap allowed explorers, especially those from the United States and Great Britain to travel deeper than ever before into the polar region using waterways which until then had been unwelcoming sheets of ice. Since the days of Henry Hudson and the earliest English exploration of North America, the quest for the fabled Northwest Passage had occupied the minds of explorers and adventurers, and the opportunity presented by changing weather conditions was simply too good to pass up. 1818 was the first year in a new series of English-led polar expeditions which continued for most of the 19th century. Among them was an expedition led by Englishman John Ross, which included a counterclockwise navigation around Baffin Bay. This also had the effect of opening the waters up to whaling ships. Though the Northwest Passage eluded him, as it did so many others over history, the boom to the whaling industry was immediate, and whalers from Great Britain and the United States were soon delivering the fine oil for illumination to ports around the world. By 1820, the effects of the year with no summer were relegated to history, a part of family lore in which elders described to children the weather events of the past as far more consequential than those of the current day. Unknown to them, the real effects continued for decades, and in some ways, continue to this very day. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do smash that like button below, and do not forget to subscribe. Brand new videos every day of the week. When you're subscribing, hit the notification bell. Also, why not check out another channel I do called Biographics. It's uh, notable people from history, biographies of them, obviously. It's linked to below, and thank you for watching.